Uh, speakers, uh, Ivan Vaslo, and he's talking about experiments with test setup. Um, I think I'll just hand it over to him. Thanks. Hello. I spend my days in the financial industry where I sit next to depressed programmers who have to work on systems that nobody really understands anymore. And my job is to help them to deal with that and to create some order in that chaos. Then I come home and I work on uh, our project called Real, which is uh, where it lets you build a web application where you don't have to write any JavaScript or HTML or CSS, just Python. Uh, example is up there. The idea is that you have something like a widget in Python at last that you instantiate and then it can have arbitrary complicated behavior in the end on the browser. If you're interested in that, that's a link to a talk I gave at EuroPython about the whole thing. What I'm going to talk to you about today is not rocket science. Um, in fact, I'm kind of worried it's too simple for this audience, so you let me know afterwards. But it comes from the context of real and how we do things and also how I do things everywhere I go. So if you sit with a big, complicated system, the reason why it typically is big and complicated is because it's got a big and complicated uh, problem domain. Especially in the financial industry, I don't know if you know how regulated that is in South Africa, but it's lots of details. It turns out, though, that when people write books, they also are actually trying to explain a complicated problem domain to someone. And, and if you write a book, what you do typically is you don't just write lots of stuff, you structure it in a way. And you summarize that structure in something called the table of contents. I find this very worthwhile for big topics. So just look at it a little bit. For example, it, uh, it means that you can forget a whole lot of details. Uh, I struggle to fit details into my head, so you can just see the things that are actually important. But you can actually zoom in and see specific, more detailed topics, if you'd like, and see where they actually fit into the rest of this big picture. I think that's also very valuable. So. I actually view a system in the same way that I view a book. It's a complicated topic, the problem domain of the system. And we create a table of contents for all our systems. This is a, a chunk of what's in real itself. Um, so for example, if I have to explain to you about this thing, I'll probably start with widgets and tell you what a widget is before I move on to a more complicated thing like layout, for example, etc., etc. So tests actually come in at the point where you say, well, okay, I've created a lot of structure, but at some point I need to tell you uh, facts about this thing to explain how it actually works. And that's when we write tests. And that's a very particular use for tests. Uh, not many people do it that way. But I come from this bias. Because I have this bias, there are a couple of conventions that we typically use when we write tests, and here are a couple... Uh, mostly off-the-cuff ones. Uh, obviously, if the test fits into that structure, it means it must explain something. That's its purpose. Its purpose is to remind me next year when I read it again what this means, uh, much more than it is to actually run and not break. Uh, next, it has a topic and it has a content, uh, context, so it must fit somewhere in the structure. If it is trying to say something that doesn't fit anywhere, then perhaps I need to change the whole structure, of course. And it has a scope, so we typically don't test something just because we've already gone to the effort of setting up something that we can reuse in that particular test. It must just say what it has to say, so that I can read it again. And very importantly for us also is that this test must be decoupled from its implementation or from implementation details that are irrelevant to the fact that it's trying to express. Because otherwise if we say refactor something then we have to change our tests as well. There, there is a bit of a religious debate about this. Some people are called classicists and some people are called mockists. 
Um, you, you might enjoy Martin Fowler's article about the difference there uh, when he talks about box and stubs that sort of leads to all of this. But so just to state for the record, so we're on the classicist side of all of this. So let's look at the tools, and I have to look at them with this point of view. In uh, the early 90s, there was a system called the C3 system. It's very much in debate whether the system uh, really has been a success currently, because it doesn't exist anymore. But uh, a lot of people who are now quite well known uh, were connected to this project in some way or another. And a lot of, lot of buzzwords actually came out of it. Uh, buzzwords that are now sort of re reaching uh, buzzword middle age, I think. Of course, the, what also happened there is that Kent Beck wrote SUnit, which was the first testing framework, well, the first one that I know of anyways, of this kind. And from it, all the others were spawned that you know, probably like JUnit and our, our own unit test. And what happened in the Python world is that uh, a lot of big Python projects found that it was lacking in some respects, and they added extensions onto it to, to fit their own bill. And projects like Nose, for example, is also an extension to that. And uh, there's a bunch of other stuff. PyTest, of course, is completely different, uh, completely new genes happening there. I, I like to look at these things, and this is what I hope to give you today, is a like, very simple but historical perspective. So if, if you go and look at the documentation of unit test, especially a nice old version, you'll see that they explain or define three important things. Firstly is this concept of a fixture. What is a fixture? So, uh, and that's my translation, all the stuff that you need for your test to run, right? So it's a collection of things. And the test case being a, a single test, a suite being a group of them, which is less important to me right now. And this, you probably know, is what it looks like with a setup and a test method. Uh, I, there isn't a tear down here. This actually comes out of the documentation of one of the older uh, unit test versions. So just a graphical version of that. To me, this is a not quite, doesn't quite follow the Zen of Python in a way, because it, um, it's a bit confusing. So you have something that inherits from test case, so it is a test case, yet it contains two test cases. And it's got this setup method that creates all the stuff that is actually the collection of which they define as, as being the fixture. So it's not quite clearly defined, all those things. If you go into the uh, implementation details, it sort of makes sense, but it should make sense earlier, right? Here's probably how a lot of people think about this subconsciously maybe even when they use this stuff, is to think of this class as actually being a shared fixture. It's the same sort of stuff that's going to be created each time for all the test cases that are on it. And one of the reasons why people often think about it like this is because they want to reuse little bits of the setup that they've already written. So one, one way of doing that, of course, is just to inherit from it. Uh, this has all kinds of problems, but the one very easy practical problem is that if you inherit from it, it will also run the test methods again that it inherits. So you don't really want that. Of course, a more puritanical way would be to say, well, let the one class use the other one. This is quite doable. Problem is that it means that in your setup, you will now have to create the other thing and set it up. And you, in your teardown, you will have to tear it down and do, do things like that. And there's a, a trick or two that you'd have to do, because you can't actually instantiate one of these things without passing it a method name. So you have to trick it a little bit. The, the other way is, of course, that you can not put any test methods in the thing you want to inherit from, and then you can happily inherit from it. But then you run into the typical problems. Well, first of all, it's not a good idea to use inheritance for the purpose of reusing code, right? But uh, the practical problems here, again, is 
what if you have multiple methods with the same names and we, what method resolution order is going to win for you and whatever so but it can be done right so the the plain old test unit can can do these things the the other problem though that we sit with is that it takes very long to create things like database connections for every test that runs so we want to reuse them in another way we want to say I want to create it once and reuse it for, let's say, my whole test run and then kill it off again. And this test unit didn't really uh, allow for it all in the beginning. So along came nodes at that point, and they said, OK, let's do something about this. Let's do, instead of the setup and tear down that we already have that gets run around a single method, let's put a setup class and tear down class which means that the setup would run before any of the tests on this class are run and the teardown will be run after all of them have run. And they expanded this whole thing. Knows is all about this whole context story because they realized that, well, a test class is in a test module. Only one of the classes in there. And there are probably more than one module next to each other in a package and so on and so on. And so they also added the ability for you to put set up and tear down pairs around all the tests in a module or all the tests in a package. So this is the big sort of claim to fame uh, of nodes as far as I understand it. There are problems with this though. If you, if you look back at how we want to organize our tests, we organize it so that it helps our understanding. But if you're in this world, it means that you have to organize it such that all the tests that reuse something that's already been set up must be together in a package or a module or whatever. So you're constrained in that way, and that's a problem. The other people have other problems with this. For example, sometimes they want to run tests in different orders, because if you have a large project, it kind of makes sense to make the tests that that are more likely to break, run first, right? Then you get the quicker feedback from it. Or run tests in parallel, etc. So once again, you've got a problem here. You can't just run the tests in the order of your package structure and rely on that. The, these are the four things, in other words, that, that we sort of sit with, that we care about, concerns that we have. We care about how tests are organized. We care about how test setup is reused, the actual code. We care about the life cycle of something that's been set up. How long is it going to live and how long will it be reused by different tests? And then also the order in which tests are run. You, you might want to play with that. And th the thing about these things is you actually want to change or specify one of these things without influencing the other. They shouldn't constrain each other. I'm going to sort of take a detour into Java world, forgive me. So, in the meantime, something happened in this project called TestNG. And they've discovered Java's annotations, which are very much like Python's uh, decorations. Uh, decorators, sorry. Uh, I quite like this. Here's what they did. It's very much like Nose, in the sense that they can run a method before the test or after the test, or they have a method that can run before all the tests in the class are run and after all the tests, except that you don't have to use specific names for these things. You can call a method what you want to call a method and just annotate it and just say, this is actually a test method or this is actually the thing that must run before each test method, etc., etc. I like this because it allows you to give all your methods meaningful names. So it's an interesting idea. They went big on that. Then, I don't know where this originated, uh, but I work a lot with S Smalltalk and the old S unit, and it's also grown over time a little bit. They have this idea that instead of fixtures, etc., etc., you could also have a, a test resource. Test resource also being something like a server or that you need to start up or a connection or whatever. And a test case can use many of these test resources. 
turns out that there is a project in Python world as well that does this. That's why I said I don't know which one happened first. It's quite an old project. It didn't get much mind share, but it's out there. It's being maintained. They just use slightly different terminology. So there you can also have something called a resource manager now, which is a thing that is supposed to manage resources for you, specific things. In this case, this is from their documentation, a bizarre populated branch, which presumably maybe takes some time to create. This is what the code looks like. What you typically do is just to say, uh, have a resources class variable there saying uh, basically what resources you want and which resource managers it must use to create those resources. So in this particular case, you said you wanted it named branch and you want to use bizarre populated branch resource manager and then it will make sure that once your test is run you will have a dot branch attribute and it will manage it. You still have to worry about lifecycle and things all on your own but this is an idea. It was debated, was not allowed into unit test by the way. So <clears throat> here's just a summary at what we've covered so far. So you know, this whole thing about how we organize our tests, maybe you want to do it differently, but it's a thing. This whole thing about what is a fixture, this I think is one of the big blind spots in this world. What is a fixture really? It was defined, but people sort of lost track of that. I'll talk about that in a moment. And um, there's this thing of reusing the code that creates this similar fixtures each time, or reusing an instance of the fixture. Then this whole idea of using annotations, I think, is interesting. And then there's this sort of difference between using fixtures or using test resources. This is sort of seems like all the ideas that, that I'm aware of that came out of these, these old projects. And then there's PyTest, right, which you probably all use, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so in PyTest, it's, it's broken the mold completely because you just write a method, a uh, function actually, and by name, if you have another fu function which is marked with a Python decorator as a pytest.fixture, then it will make sure that it calls that function and passes that option, uh, that object that it returns into your test function, right? And they can do some more magic tricks because they can deal with what they call the scope of this thing, so they can make this object live for the entire test run if they need to, which is nice. And lately they've also started using Python's um, generators so that you can yield this thing and then do the tear run right after in the same method, which is also kind of cool. But, so PyTest is cool, but if you look at it a little bit with all this history, what's really going on here? What's the model that they're building here? Uh, you can't really say, oh, you've got a bunch of test functions, and then what is on the other hand? What, what is the stuff that it's using? I, I actually think I'm sucking this out of my thumb, but I've, saw, I've, I've seen that people started referring to setup and teardown methods as your fixture and there's fixtures and so on and fixture methods and words like that. So I have a suspicion they thought, oh, this is a fixture function. And that's now they've got at fixture. Um, which is, sorry, I, the way I sort of see it is, oh, you've got test cases still. Each method is really a test case, right? And you've got a bunch of test resources. And, of course, they've got a little bit more built around it because uh, they've got this whole idea of context as well and how long it will live and so on. So this is just how, how I like to see it, given the previous things. Now, I, I want to move on to a different kind of problem. Because we're classicists, it, it means we don't stub out lots of stuff. And sometimes when you want to test the simplest little thing, you have to create a whole forest of objects. This is an example. In this particular example, we just want to test that when you settle an investment, that the advisor gets paid the commission amount in the correct bank account. So uh, 
you need an investment because you're going to have to say investment or settle. But an investment can't exist if you don't create an account. It must be part of an account. But an account can't exist if it doesn't have an owner, which is an investor, which happens to be a role, which can't exist if there isn't a person. And there's no way that you'd be able to settle an investment if this person doesn't have FICA documents that are in order, etc., etc., etc. So there's a whole forest of, of objects to create here. And the question is, how do you do this? Because it can mess up your test quite a bit. Here's the test without such setup with the assumption that we already have a bank account and an investment here. And that's how simple the test can be. You can just say, uh, make sure the balance is zero before you start. Settle the investment and check that the balance in the correct bank account, presumably, is uh, what you expect for commission on this investment, right? So that's pretty readable. It's a test that says something. So let me fill in the blanks. This is a trick that Martin Fowler has termed the object mother. If you have some object on which you extract a bunch of methods that will create these things for you that you want, then you hide it from your test. So the test is nice and readable. And you can just ask that other object to give you all the stuff you need. The trouble with, with object mothers is that they tend to grow a lot of methods. And particularly, they tend to grow methods that are each just a little bit different from the other one, like an advisor with an, a versus an advisor with an invalid license, or uh, an investor with FICA that's outstanding, or whatever. So in response to this, the builder pattern was suggested. And uh, again, Java warning, sorry. So. The, the idea behind the builder pattern is that you create this class. You, you get to write it all yourself from beginning to end. And, but what this class does, in this particular case, the person builder, what it does is it, when you create it, it hangs on to a lot of defaults, all the sort of just stuff that you would want if you just want a person and you don't care about the details of this person. So it doesn't create the person yet. Only when you call a special method build will it create it. And then the builder can have other methods on it, like with name or with contact details or whatever, which changes this information that this builder is hanging on to. So the idea is that you use it kind of like this. If you just want a person and you don't care about what's inside this person, you just say person builder dot build, and you have your person. But now you can compose things a little bit because you can say person builder dot with name something dot bold and then you've got something slightly different and you can now in your test actually express a lot more stuff quite easily with a builder pattern so it's quite a useful thing this is what it looks like uh, it's a bit of a trick because these with methods need to return the, the actual person uh, builder again so that you can chain etc etc so we sort of looked at this quite a bit and thought, but OK, it looks valuable. How can we do it in Python? And it was actually, we started building classes and things and then realized chaining doesn't work that well in Python and thought a little bit harder and came to the conclusion, but you know what? We have keyword arguments in Python. So you don't need all kinds of classes and build methods and stuff. You can actually just have a function that will create this person for you and pass in a bunch of defaults in the keyword arguments. Of course, Python being Python, you can't create objects uh, as defaults for your keyword arguments, otherwise the whole world will share the same one. But you can do tricks like passing none and then test for that inside your method and then create whatever defaults you need to create. Okay. So this for us was quite a neat trick. Here's how you would use it. It's pretty much similar to the Java version, except it's Python, and therefore a little bit better. <laughs> but we always have objects that actually relate to one another. We never have things that just stand alone. So the person that we're talking about here is a particular person. The bank account is a particular bank account. 
uh, and so on. So uh, these bunch of objects typically go together when you write tests. They, they belong in the same scenario. So we actually like to put them together. And therefore, we started putting them on a class like this, so that they're all kind of organized in one little package. And also, you can do nice things, that, like what I've done there in the top method, new person. So for example, if you don't specify any contact details, you can just call new contact detail on yourself. And then you know which one you're getting. So this, this I think, is the best of both, both worlds of object mothers and the builder pattern and Python, perhaps. It's just something that worked really well for us. But then we went one step further, and we created something called a fixture. And I must say, looking back, I'm thinking perhaps I should have chosen a different name, since this is such a, an overused word. But so what a fixture is, is exactly just that. It's something with builder methods, if I can call them that. But we added a little trick to it. We said that if you call, for example, dot person on this thing, if you access an attribute, it will actually automatically go and call the new person method without passing it any arguments, in other words, using the defaults. And then it will remember that person that it returned, and it will store it as the attribute person on the fixture so that if you call it again and again and again, you get the same person back, because you, do, you don't want new ones created all the time. This is actually quite a neat trick in, in our experience, because it means that, for instance, if you look at that method, new bank account, there I can refer to self.person. And I can refer to self.person in my test lower down as well, multiple times, and I'm assured that I get the same one. What, what this does is it sort of hides the complexity about uh, that, that concerns which object is dependent on which other one is dependent on which other one. So in your test, you don't have to know about this. Of course, in your fixture, you need to know. But once you write your test, you just refer to these things, and it, and it happens. This is something that works really really well for us. So where does this fit into history? I very quickly came up with this picture, because I felt I had to say how it fits into history. I think you can see a fixture as just a special kind of test resource that, that contains a bunch of other test resources in a special way. We Currently, we're a bit stuck on Nose. We have got a plugin for Nose to make these things work very well with Nose, but we don't have one for PyTest, so, and we really would like one. So if you're interested in your PyTest guru, please come and talk to me. Here's a, a bit more. We added some more stuff, and I'm not going to show you everything. Uh, but we can also use decorators to decorate certain methods on this fixture. And then if you use it as a context manager, it has its own little setup that will get called. So everything you marked as setup will be set up. And everything you marked as teardown will be torn down at the end of the block of the context. We use it very often for transactions, because we would connect to the database at the beginning of the test run, and then we will start a transaction before each test and abort it at the end. And this is the mechanism that does that for us. Of course, you also don't have to set up actually lots of stuff, because the point is you just call the method or use the attribute, which will automatically call the method, that you want. When you want it, that's all you do. And there are ways to tear down those things if you really want to. But I think there's only one instance where we care about that. Because if you create things in a database and you roll back, you know, they, they're gone anyways. If you want to use this with PyTest, what you could do is something like this. So you could create a PyTest fixture, fixture function, if you like, that just yield something inside of this context manager, and you get quite a bit of the functionality of the fixtures already, just, uh, just to tie it to PyTest. We, we're still looking for a nice way to do this and support all the other things that our fixtures can, can actually do. That's it. If you're interested in this stuff, please talk to me. Let me know whether this was useful to hear or not. Thanks. Um. Questions? Questions?
Um, any questions? Uh, I wanted to have you use Factory Boy, the port, the Python port from Factory Girl on the Ruby side, and how does that compare with these fixtures? Well, that's supposed to be a similar thing, isn't it? I have no idea what you're talking about. I'll have to go check. Okay. <laughs> I I, um, I don't do much Ruby either. Uh, I, uh, it's very painful. It's a <laughs> yeah. So just when you use the setup and teardown decorators, how do you control the order in which they run? If you have, I assume you can have multiple if you want multiple setup or teardown steps. But sometimes you need to be able to order them. Shucks, I can't remember. I remember that that was an issue. I'll have to. I'll, I'll have to look at the code to answer that, if you but, want to stick there, around. But there is a... But you, anyway, there is, yeah. I remember that it was an issue, and also that you, you want the... If, if you have a particular order for setting up stuff, then you want the reverse order for tearing them down as well. So, uh, oh, I remember now what we do is, uh, for tearing down anyways, when we create a new thing, we put it in a list. When we create another one, we add it onto the list. So we have an order. We have a list of all of them, of them and the order in which they were created. And the teardown happens in reverse of that order. I actually have another question if no one else wants to go first. Um, so uh, something which used to be a big pain in the, the old unit test class is that if your setup function failed midway through, it wouldn't run the teardown. And that often led to things like thread leaks and, and nasty things. And then they added the add cleanup mechanism, which kind of fixed that. And that also gives you that reverse automatic reverse order. Uh, so, so do you just when you work with a setup and teardown, are you sure that the test, the teardown will definitely get called? Because otherwise you yes. have a test not finishing because yes. the test is still running. Or yeah. It gets reported separately as well. Hi. Uh, sorry, I might have missed it in the presentation, but w um, what's the scoping of, of the fixtures? Is, there, is it limited to class scoping? or um, You got me there. That's the bit I left out. Okay. <laughs> what we did is we actually wrote a, a plugin for Nose for our own use. And that means it's tied to Nose way of scoping things. Well, not entirely. We also have we built in one thing to say that you can have one fixture that actually gets set up before all your tests are run and gets stored down at the end. And that's what we built into Nose, and we use that. And I don't know if you, if you saw, where was it? I always construct the fixture with none. That's supposed to be the run fixture it's constructed with. <laughs> but I don't think that's a good mechanism, so I didn't want to tell you all about that. What we really need to do is find a better way to make it work with by test scoping mechanism. And, and also, you know, what we often d did in the past was to have fixtures inheriting from each other. You know, I have a database one and have a web one that also starts, like, say, say a browser. Uh, inheriting from the database one, and that obviously is bad design, so we don't want that. And I think, yeah, a PyTest thing, a PyTest guru would be very welcome. This looks extremely useful. Do you have some more extensive uh, bits of code up somewhere to play around with? Well, the whole of Real is on GitHub. We actually moved from Launchpad to GitHub recently. Um, so it is up there, and you're welcome to email me and talk to me about it. I don't know how accessible the code is. We still need, we don't have a lot of developer documentation. That's something that we actually want to work on after we got this whole GitHub thing uh, down. But it is on there. Hi, there, just a, a quick one. So your database tests, you start a transaction and then a roll it back at the end. Um, what is your kind of setup of what's in the database before your test starts? How does that work? Before the test starts, the database is empty. It only has tables, but they're empty. What we do is in the run fixture, we create all the tables. Um, yeah, and then the test itself has to create everything that needs to be in there. Yes, we use, uh, uh, the question was, do some of those fixtures put stuff into the database? They, they do. 
because we use SQL Alchemy for everything. And of course, if you do SQL Alchemy, it's going to create stuff in the database. Yeah. We, we do a lot of other tricks, actually, that, is, that I haven't seen elsewhere with the database stuff uh, and, and the webby stuff. For example, we don't run a separate web server in a separate thread. We actually sort of patch something into the Selenium drivers so that everything runs in one thread, which means that if something breaks in the server, your test will immediately break and you won't get a 4 of 500 error or something that you have to check for and wonder where that happened. Questions? Okay, thank you, Ivan. Thanks. I just